This whole idea of congested, contested, and invested, of course, grows out of the USDOD notion that they take that same phrase and end it with competitive. Uh, but there is something that needs to be said to take it to the next level. And so that's what I'm going to concentrate on doing after just a very brief review of some of the things that have happened in these last 10 years that have really brought home the congested and contested part. We've got over 1,225 operating satellites right now. A very large portion of those are U.S., but there are an enormous number of countries now participating. Over 60 countries are operating a satellite, according to the United Nations right now. In the last 10 years, over 7,000 new pieces of debris have emerged from just really two events. Uh, the Chinese ASAT test of 2007 and the, uh, co the Cosmos Iridium uh, events, the collision, uh, the Newtonian experiment that was not uh, too pleasant. In 2007, the United Nations and a group known as the Interagency Debris uh, Committee actually managed to bring to bear an international agreement on seven guidelines, not rules, not treaties, but seven guidelines that deal with trying to reduce the amount of debris uh, that's being produced. Those guidelines have begun to actually get some traction. There was a report from uh, Canada and uh, Germany delivered uh, last year to the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space that actually detailed specific country-by-country -country progress being made in debris mitigation, especially launch debris, uh, debris that's created by uh, the launcher or by the process of um, uh, injecting a spacecraft into orbit. Compliance with those guidelines has been incorporated directly already into the space law of one country. Uh, that's France in 2008. It, it incorporated those rules. But in fact, the United States, for all intents and purposes, was already complying with every one of those guidelines with a couple of DOD exceptions. In 2009, of course, Cosmos and Iridium hit each other. In 2010, you might remember Galaxy 15, Zombie Sat, wandering through the geosynchronous arc, uh, suddenly looking like a very strange form of debris because it was out of control but still radiating. It was still broadcasting. Um, by 2012, Poland launched its first satellite, a small satellite that in fact made it, I think, the 50th country to have actually brought uh, a satellite uh, to orbit. There have been uh, some 10 other countries joined since, and highlighting the increasing importance of small satellites. In 2013, Ecuador's very first satellite gets one month of service before it collides with what appears to have been an old Soviet era uh, booster. It's not a direct collision, it's a collision with its debris field. Uh, nonetheless, it puts that satellite uh, out of commission. And throughout the ISPCS era, the last 10 years, uh, China has conducted an active series of anti-satellite tests one of which actually uh, produced debris. The others have been conducted so as not to produce debris. <clears throat> there is not a single promising business plan that anybody has talked about or even suggested at this event that would not be rendered much less effective or impossible if we do not correct this problem of space debris. Add to that problem the growing problem of radio frequency interference because any payload you get up there needs to communicate 
and the communications problem is getting more and more challenging. And not just satellite to satellite problems, not just intentional jamming problems, but a growing competition for frequency with terrestrial uses that are in most cases much better funded than the best funded endeavors uh, within our sector. So there is no doubt in my mind, <clears throat> there's no doubt in my mind that there has been substantial increase in congestion and in the contesting of different um, models and even geopolitical ambitions in space. But thanks to the people in this room, space has also become invested. Invested in a way that government expenditures never made it invested. Because there was always the sense that the taxpayers probably had deep enough pockets to help governments replace space assets, especially the big players. Uh, you have to work in an environment where not only could it ruin your business plan, it could ruin your financial capability, destroy the financial stability of your organization, uh, and lead to uh, business failure. That means that as you look at the future of space, as you look at the future not only of your ability to carry launchers to space, but increasingly interesting and complicated and maybe small payloads, the problem of debris uh, becomes one uh, that you have to uh, deal with. And we heard at least two or three speakers today uh, specifically address this issue uh, of the importance debris is playing in uh, mission planning. Uh, very expensive risks of very big challenges. There are, however, I suggest, opportunities here. Ten years ago, most of the successful business plans we're hearing reported on today were, in fact, laughed at by people generally not in this room, although there were a few, but they were laughed at as being woefully impossible to finance or to make work. Uh, the reality is that we have made them work. And I think the same thing is going on now when people talk about how do we get debris out of orbit. And, you know, there's all sorts of questions about the tiny stuff. I think they're creative enough people here to be figuring that one out. But let's start with the big stuff. Um, is there any particular market for bringing Envisat out of orbit? Uh, having lived in Europe, I can tell you that the level of political and technical embarrassment in Europe has never been higher than I've seen it with a, a continent that loves to say it's on the forefront of green thinking and of modern environmental sensitivity, suddenly finding that a public enemy number one in, in low Earth orbit is a satellite that they somehow operated longer than they intended to, and they ran out of fuel um, trying to extend its life. When they had a plan for using the last 5% to plop it into the South Pacific. Um, uh, there is political money there to get that out of, um, out of orbit. I don't think you'll be able to do it without a European partner. The politics are that way. Uh, on the other hand, if you've got a great idea, uh, they would love to see that piece of garbage out of orbit. Um, if you could find a way to fund getting about nine proton bodies out of orbit, you would take basically the top 10 public enemies of space debris and um, eliminate them, significantly reducing the risk of follow-on cascading collisions. Uh, is there a business plan there? I, I, I'm not sure. The, the, the challenge is I can't tell you where all the cash flows come from. But I can tell you that people in this room and people who have been part of these symposia over the last 10 years have been smart enough to solve problems that are just this hard. Um, and uh, solve it, and uh, you're likely to have um, at least a, uh, a market uh, for dealing with uh, well, 20,000 pieces of debris at least the size of a softball. 
uh, that are floating around up there. So in fact, um, there is a business opportunity there. I think there is also a business opportunity as you start thinking about what does it mean to be invested in space, uh, to start developing space-based missions that deal with um, solving some of the more intractable problems uh, on Earth. Some of this is community planning, some of this is refugee management, some of this is um, uh, creative farming in, in developing areas. Uh, the fact is there's already at least one effort to do this. You've heard about O3B, this other three billion effort to bring broadband to the three billion who don't have it. Uh, somebody out there, uh, led by a coalition of uh, large-scale uh, broadcast companies believes that they can find enough economy of scale to make a very novel approach to providing broadband, this swarm approach, uh, um, essentially uh, you know, using, uh, using satellites almost like movable cell towers. Uh, you know, don't move the computer, move the cell tower. Um, in order to provide uh, broadband in places where it has not previously uh, been uh, provided. Uh, another area of investment, another area where your investment is likely to create new business opportunities that we didn't talk about as much uh, at this event, um, is the sourcing of those supplied parts that so many of your companies have managed to combine into totally novel technologies in order to deliver uh, what needed to be uh, done. So in fact, what you've got is an opportunity to understand you live now in a field that is no longer of dreams but of realities. A field where just like the Pi Town discussion you can see on the walls of this museum where the people who moved into the community took care of the community that they had moved into. And the community you've moved into until somebody can get us a lot farther away is this extraordinary near-Earth orbital and maybe before too long cislunar environment. I think that you can make good things happen I think that you can apply your knowledge to going forward and recognizing that 10 years from now we'll have accomplished a meta goal. I think 10 years from now we ought to be able, um, we ought to, be able to look at the world that we're in and recognize that we are taking care of one small neighborhood that happens to be the neighborhood of planet Earth. Get that done in 10 years, that's power.